Welcome to SSUC, Spiritual Seekers United in Community. We are an inclusive community seeking to live out a more just and generous spirituality. We believe spirituality isn't about doctrines and beliefs demanding agreement, but is about living fully and loving deeply. What unites us is our desire to create community where all belong. Where we're all safe to be ourselves where we can question and ponder and seek meaningful lives. We affirm that what matters most is who we are, how we treat each other, how we work to make our communities better. We welcome the entire human family. All ages, all colors, all abilities. All cultures, all genders, all sexualities. All religions and traditions, or none. So if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest. If you are grateful and have come to share. If you are journeying and have come to grow. If you are wounded and have come to heal. Welcome. Welcome. If you are joyful and have come to shine. Welcome. 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 <laughs> Welcome home. to this spiritual gathering, this last gathering in the month of June, as we honor Pride Month, a time to celebrate the colorful diversity of gender identities and sexual orientations, a time to acknowledge the struggles for the freedom just to be, a time to lament violence, fear and hatred, a time to remember the courage of so many LGBTQ2S plus individuals and allies who have resisted inequity, who have marched for freedom, who fought for acceptance, and who have struggled for the right to simply be. As we gather in this place, in this time, we stand with all around the world who still struggle for dignity and inclusion. Those who are imprisoned, persecuted, <clears throat> and sometimes executed for being themselves. Thank you for taking time to be with us here at SSUC. Southminster Steinhauer United Church, where we are spiritual seekers, united in community, united in solidarity, and seeking to express a radical hospitality for all people, for all sizes, all ages, all colors, all cultures, all genders and gender identities, all sexualities, all religions, or none at all, all abilities, all statuses, all types. I'm joined in welcoming you today by Eric, who's at the piano. When I see Eric, I know it's summer because for many summers now, he has helped us by providing some relief to our regular pianists who get a chance to have a little bit of a summer break so welcome, Eric. We're delighted that you're with us today at the keyboard. And I'm also joined by Pam and Heidi, who will lead us in song, by Noah and Joseph, who are helping us shorten the distance between us with all things technical, and Pam and Dawn, who are here holding space for each of you. My teammate, Christopher New, is on vacation after a long delayed, much earned time 
to just be away to enjoy these summer days. As we pause to locate ourselves in time, we also take this moment to locate ourselves in place, to acknowledge the land on which we place our feet, the long story of the indigenous people of this land, the rich heritage of traditions, ceremonies, medicines, languages, practices, songs, stories, values and teachings which have struggled to survive amid systemic racism and colonization. As immigrants and settlers, we also acknowledge and lament the pain, the deep wounds and the inexplicable acts of inhumanity our ancestors brought to the indigenous people of this land. And by our presence with one another, we commit to respectful and healing ways. Those of us in Saskatoon and in Edmonton honor the Cree and Métis people of Treaty 6, who've lived and worked this land for generations. And wherever we live, as immigrants, as refugees, as indigenous peoples, whether in treaty territories or unceded lands, may we find a humble and hopeful and healing way together on this storied land. We take a moment with each other as we place ourselves in the songs and prayers, in the music and musings, in the readings and reflections we'll share with one another, to join in a ritualized moment as we light our candles. And wherever you are, I invite you to light a candle in your space as I light a candle here in this space, creating a focused place, a focused time, We welcome the light that has traveled deep through time and space to meet our eyes in this new day. We welcome the wisdom that comes in the light of diversity from our differing histories and cultures, languages, traditions, orientations and identities and social locations. And as we center on the flame that we have lit before us. May we open to the mystery of being as we open to the mystery of fire with the earth beneath us, the stars above us. May we honor the light within us, within each of us, within all of us.
want to share with you again a video that was created by some of our youth a number of years ago. A tale about belonging. It's a socks tale. It goes like this.
the dice it had to be the only one for me is you and you for me so happy together June is usually the month of parades, parades that have grown out of protest. In these last two years, June of 2020 and again in June of 2021, pride parades have not happened because of the pandemic. Virtual pride parades have been experienced instead. The question was asked, about this time last year of a number of individuals, what does pride mean to you? And here's some of their answers. So question number one, what does pride mean to you? Pride to buddy <laughs> means being free to be oneself. <laughs> Eating lots of biscuits. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> well, to me, pride is your round. If it is pride, if it is black history, month. I live in New York City, so I'm surrounded by queers all the time. But sometimes when I go to other towns, I see people who are like, this is the one time a year I get to unabashedly hold my partner's hands in the street. Pride to me is having the ability to be truly yourself, celebrating in color and having that pride, literally during pride. Pride to me means celebrating our shared experience as queer people. And it also means the opposite of shame, which is what Brene Brown talks about on her podcast. She's so good, she's amazing, she's amazing. 
Pride to me is just knowing exactly who you are and being it fearlessly with 110% of your being. I mean, it's always gonna be a celebration for me. So pride is a celebration, celebrating who I am. It's celebrating what I've been through. It's celebrating those who have put in the work to make the change that happened today. To me, pride means a chance to celebrate who we are. It's uh, also a recognition of uh, how much work there is to be done for true equality. Pride means fighting back. Even before Stonewall, activists declared their pride in opposition to a government that told them they were sick and immoral. The very first pride parade exactly 50 years ago was a march of resistance. And now, as we unite to protect the most marginalized in our community, it's time to make pride an act of resistance once again. Last year, I was part of the Reclaim Pride Coalition, and we marched up Fifth Avenue instead of down Fifth Avenue to bring attention to the corporate celebration that pride had become. To me, pride means I am enough. My queerness, my blackness, and their intersections are not my burden, but my superpower. Pride means celebrating every single layer of yourself and living out loud with no shame. This is who I am. Take it or leave it. Pride it means a lot to me, but June takes on a special meaning because it's the month I got to do my show, Night of a Thousand Judies, where we gave back to the community. And at the heart of Pride, I think, is the community. Pride is about resilience and honoring the folks who came before us in the fight for queer liberation, the folks who were on the front lines, especially trans women of color. It's a time when we come together to remember our history, where we come from, born of riots, and to take that energy and use it to envision a future free from oppression for all people. Pride means to me an opportunity. An opportunity to, while we are celebrating, remind everybody that the trans community still faces so much discrimination. Pride to me means being unapologetically yourself 100% of the time. Pride means standing in your authenticity no matter what anybody thinks. The opportunity to walk in authenticity and in integrity, to show who you really are, no matter who you are in front of. It's about being your full self in every room that you're in. It's about honoring your ancestors and your history. What Pride means to me has changed pretty dramatically over the years. And when I first came out, for me, what Pride meant was just simple exposure. And when I think of Pride now, I think of Barbara Giddings, I think of Bayard Rustin, um, I think of the Mattachian Society, and I, I know more now about why Pride is so important, but also why Pride is so impactful. What Pride means to me is honoring our movement's elders and veterans and honoring them with direct action. When I celebrate Pride Month, I think about the fact that it was Harvey Milk who first exhorted us all to come out, come out wherever you are, to family, to friends, so that we can replace myth and stereotype with a slice of reality. Pride is a time to celebrate, to come together as a community, and it's also a time to look forward to what we need to do as a community. Although this year it will likely be, you know, lots of glitter and maybe a marathon of the Golden Girls alone in my living room, which is fine. Pride to me means every year taking inventory of my journey as a queer person and really just coming together and being proud of where we stand and where we can go. I'm so proud to be part of this unbelievable community. This community that accomplishes things that, you know, 25 years ago we never could imagine. Pride is extremely complex. There are so many things involved, not only making sure that we are taking allyship uh, as far as we can go, but also just celebrating our existence. For so many of us, it felt like perhaps we weren't going to make it. We were never going to be able to live an authentic life. And sometimes, uh, during Pride, I like to just look around and celebrate that I made it, um, you know, that, that we made it. From the words of the Irish poet, John O'Donohue, in his collection of writings to bless the space between us, these words on belonging. 
May you listen to your longing to be free. May the frames of your belonging be generous enough for your dreams. May you arise each day with a voice of blessing whispering in your heart. May you find harmony between your soul and your life. May the sanctuary of your soul never become haunted. May you know the eternal longing that lives at the heart of time. May there be kindness in your gaze when you look within. May you never place walls between the light and yourself. May you allow the wild beauty of the invisible world to gather you, mind you, and embrace you in belonging. In these words, may we find what we need to live truly authentic, loving, generous lives.
How did it happen that we came to confuse pride with arrogance? That somehow life taught us that pride isn't virtuous. That it's the opposite of the virtue of humility. And it's to be avoided at all costs. My earliest learnings about pride came straight out of the Bible. I remember learning the proverb, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. In its shorthand, simpler, everyday version, we all know it as, pride cometh before a fall. But I've come to realize it was arrogance, not pride, that I ought to have been warned off of. I've come to know that the opposite of pride is shame. Not humility, shame. Self-rejection. And the antithesis of humility is arrogance, not pride. In fact, pride has everything to do with a healthy sense of self-acceptance and self-worth, not an over-inflated view of ourselves. And that it's good to feel pride in one's accomplishments. It's good to be proud of your children. It's good to take pride in one's work. It's good to be proud of the unique humans we each are. And all of that is not to say that we're proud of everything we do. We're not. But how could anyone ever tell us not to be proud of who we are, whatever our strengths, whatever our capacities, whatever our identities? The movement of pride that we celebrate in June of each year began as a protest a protest against invisibility and inequity, a protest against oppression and discrimination, an uprising, if you will, not a riot, an uprising, for the freedom just to be oneself, to dress and walk and talk and gather freely and dance with whoever you choose to dance with and love whoever your heart loves and be true to yourself. Fifty-two years ago, in the early hours of the morning on June 28th, 1969, the New York police raided the Stonewall Inn, a popular gay bar. Raids of this kind were not at all uncommon. In fact, they were very common. But what was uncommon was that on this occasion, the patrons pushed back. They pushed back against the beatings and the arrests and the threats and the shaming and the outings. And those protests went on for several days and moved out from the bar into the streets, into the neighborhood. And this courageous resistance became the catalyst for the pride movement as we know it the quest for full human rights and dignity for all gender identities and expressions, for all sexual orientations. Perhaps the freedom to be fully and wholly human is often born of protest. There's an ancient story that's told in three of the four Gospels that are handed down to us from the first century writings about Jesus of Nazareth. It's a story of a nameless woman in a faceless crowd who pushed back against invisibility. It's told as a miracle story, but I invite you to hear it as a parable.
it goes something like this. When Jesus was on his way to the home of a prominent religious leader whose only daughter was dying, a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who'd been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She'd endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing, hoping to be made well. Immediately, she felt in her body that she'd been healed of her disease. Sensing an exchange of energy, Jesus turned about in the crowd to ask, who touched me? His closest followers were exasperated with him. What are you talking about? With all these people pushing and jostling, how can you ask who touched you? Dozens have touched you. But when the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came in fear and knelt at his feet and told him all her truth. And that for the first time, in longer than she could remember, she felt whole again. Then Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. There's something tucked in this timeless story. It's a kind of healing narrative that was originally intended for a first century community who had become the untouchables of their time. More than 40 years after the death of Jesus of Nazareth, this story was being told, and it was being told to those who didn't belong anymore. They were no longer seen as children of Abraham. They didn't fit because they were searching for the relationship between the law of Moses, their first century Judaism, and the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. The orthodoxy of their time told them there was no blending of those two paths. It is either or not both and. So they had no place. They're shamed and excluded for seeking to reconcile their religious roots with their lived experience into this hurting community comes this story about a woman who has been looking for healing and belonging for more than a dozen years. The story buries her in a crowd. At first, we don't see her. She's as invisible to us in the world of the story as she is to her family and to the members of her synagogue and to her neighbors and to her community. She's been made invisible by a condition that her culture classifies as unclean. She's an untouchable because she's been hemorrhaging in a society that has been taught to fear being contaminated by her. To most of that first century crowd, she was just another bloody woman. She bled to bring others into the world. She bled in rhythm with the cycles of the earth. She was an old woman, and she's still bleeding. For a dozen years, the systems of healing had failed her. She'd tried everything, and nothing worked. 
in her anonymity, she comes through that crowd, approaches Jesus from behind to touch him, perhaps to get his attention, to reach out to this teacher, this reputed healer, one last chance. And though she managed to only touch his clothing, somehow Jesus felt the exchange of energy that happened when the space between two people is humanly warmed, wanting to turn and complete the healing they shared. Jesus turned to see who had touched him, and she finds the courage to step out of her anonymity and become visible. It was an act of protest for her to be in that crowd, to act out against the Levitical law that had made her an untouchable, had deemed her unclean, had excluded her like a leper in her society claiming she would contaminate anyone who came in contact with her. But she'd had enough. And she was desperate enough to reach through the crowd and even break through the story that had rendered her a mere interruption in this narrative because Jesus was actually on his way to the home of a very important man in the community, a religious official by the name of Cyrus, whose daughter was deathly ill, a man in the story who had a name. And this anonymous woman gets the storyteller's attention by barely touching his clothing. And the story stops Jesus in his tracks, determined to see her, and she finds the courage to be seen, to speak out, to speak up for herself, to share the truth of her experience. She refuses to stay hidden any longer. Responding to the courage of her protest, Jesus of Nazareth, in the world of this story, renders her visible. He gives her a name. He calls her daughter. He calls her out of anonymity, reinstating her into the very first relationship life gives each of us to be a son or a daughter acknowledging her as part of the human family, affirming her place as a daughter of Abraham and Sarah through the vehicle of the story. He affirms a sense of belonging among those first century Jews who were feeling so disenfranchised and so disaffiliated from their tradition, from their communities, from their people. He gives this unnamed woman a name of relationship. It had been a long time since she'd been someone's daughter. And this one who's calling her daughter is young enough to be her son. From the privileged place of his gender, as an ally, he names her as part of the family, part of the human family, part of the family of faith in the tradition of ancient Judaism which they shared. He names her with respect as one who belongs, one who matters, one who has reached out to touch what matters. Isn't he affirming the wisdom of the poet John O'Donohue, whose words we heard just a few moments ago? May you listen to 
who you're longing to be free. May there be kindness in your gaze as you look within. May you never place walls between the light and yourself. May we move with one another from shame toward pride, from anonymity to belonging, from rejection to radical acceptance, to be those who risk touching what matters in our lives, each other, those who are most invisible, or those who are most visible because they stand out from the crowd, creating a space for each other to be, giving the kind of attention and acceptance that makes it safe to come out of hiding, to be our truth, to call each other into belonging, naming one another out of the anonymous crowd and into loving, healing community. So let's take these few moments with each other in the company of music to consider how we can be part of pride, how we can be part of a healing movement of belonging. As we consider the story we heard just moments ago, an old story from the first century, may it inspire us to strengthen our intentions, to live, to bring one another into the goodness of light, of being seen, 
of being visible, of being one who matters, one who belongs. So as we do each time we gather, we take a moment to focus our intentions on how it is that we wish to live, which is to say, we pray with one another. Let's share these words together as our prayer this day. In caring for one another, may we be untiring. In challenging one another, may we be respectful. In sheltering one another, may we be strong. In holding one another, may we be tender. In the expectations we have of one another, may we be realistic. In the songs we sing with one another, may we seek harmony. And in loving one another, may we be all these things and more. As we seek to be inspired to live more nearly as we pray, may it be so. I want to take a few moments to share a few invitations and announcements with you while we're together in this time, in this spiritual gathering. You can connect with us in a variety of ways you see on the screen. Although our office is closed and our facility remains closed over the summer months, you can reach us by email, you can reach us via Facebook, you can reach us by phone. And we will be gathering with one another in some smaller, informal kinds of ways over the course of the summer as a way to reconnect with one another. Project Reconnect is taking a little break this week because of the hot weather, but will resume again as um, the weather cools off in the following week and gather in smaller groups with some SSUC friends to sh share uh, uh, just an informal, unprogrammed time with one another. I want to share the news too that we are aiming for a reopening to limited in-person attendance at our spiritual gatherings beginning on the 12th of September. Our office, as I mentioned, will remain closed during July and August as will our building to all uses except the few community programs that we have continued to host throughout COVID. We'll be welcoming a return to the use of our grounds for some community activities and also some SSUC community building times with one another over the summer. There will be a continued commitment to our online community. We will continue live streaming and offering some programming by video conferencing as well. And I want to speak specifically to those of you who have become part of our online community who have not typically gathered with us in the building here in Edmonton or gathered with the community of SSUC Saskatoon who meet monthly in St. Andrews College. I want to speak to each of you wherever you live, whether you're in the Edmonton area or the Saskatoon area or you're somewhere else in the country. You belong in this community, you matter to us and our commitment to you continues. Some of you have uh, responded this week to tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to connect with SSUC online and uh, to share with us some way that we can be in contact with you, whether that's by email or snail mail or by telephone. And if you haven't done that and you've been part of this online community over the last 15, 16 months or more, um, please feel welcome to reach out to us. We'd love to know who you are and we'd love to know where you are. We really appreciate the ways in which you have supported us financially, those who are able to support us. We uh, provide on the screen a number of convenient ways for that support to continue. We're also deeply grateful for those who have given their time to continue our food bank depot for those who have continued to do various tasks to maintain our facility 
to help our outreach support to community agencies to continue and to community programs. And if you're able to support us, whether your gift is a large one or a small one, a many-time one or a one-time gift, we deeply appreciate the support you offer. As we come to the close of our gathering, I mentioned that many pride parades are happening virtually this year, and our community of SSUC Saskatoon recently participated in the pride parade in Saskatoon, along with the other affirming ministries in Saskatoon. And we want to share as a way of closing our gathering, their float, their entry into the virtual Pride Parade, a song we've been singing many times over the months, a song with slightly adapted words that particularly speak to pride.
as we change our light. We add the energy of our breath, our intention, our commitment to give ourselves to letting our light shine, to nurturing and sheltering and protecting the light in one another, to respecting and honoring the light in all others. And so we go to make one another whole, to give one another a place, a place to be seen, a space to be free. We go into this day in the grace and goodness of what it is to be fully human, deeply loving and living authentically and truly to the best of our capacity, our uniqueness, our gift, our being. Let's keep one another safe and well until we are together with one another again.